Welcome in to episode 214 of the Sorts of State Podcast, your go-to Kentucky basketball and recruiting podcast on the Growing KSR Podcast Network. The Sorts of State Podcast is presented by our good friends at Justice Dental. You can make an appointment at one of two Lexington locations. That's on Wellington Way and Blazer Parkway. Now is a great time to schedule your dental cleaning. Remember that regular dental appointments are important for your overall health. You can learn more and make an appointment at justicedental.com. Dr. Justice and Dr. Thompson look forward to seeing you soon. I am your host, Jack Pilgrim of Kentucky Sports Radio. Very happy to be joined once again by the one and only Sean Smith of Go Big Blue Country. Sean, how the heck are you? I am doing fantastic. fantastic. Jack Pilgrim, how are you? Oh, hanging in there, I believe. So today, th- today's episode is going to be a little bit different. So Sean is, has a basketball game tonight, so he's going to jump on with us for uh, 20 minutes or so, however, however long we can get him. We're going to appreciate his time. We're going to talk all the ins and outs of the blue-white game. Then after that, our video producer, Steven, is going to jump on like he did with the uh, 11 personnel, talking a little bit of, uh, you know, asking some questions to Adam Luckett about football and things like that, you know, what the the latest and greatest previewing Tennessee. Uh, He is going to jump on and ask me some questions, and we're going to have some back and forth about uh, media day today and some of the uh, other stuff going on, blue-white, all that good stuff as we prepare for, uh, I guess, the exhibition game starting this week on Sunday and then uh, there's going to be another one after that and then regular season starts the week after that so basketball season is here Sean and we got our first look at the Wildcats uh, down in Pikeville an unbelievable event I want to get started with uh, the meaning behind the event why were you why were you even down there in the first place uh, as uh, Kentucky raised we're getting some back feed on this one second um all right, there we go. I think we're good. I think we're good now. Uh, the Blue White game down in Pikeville, they raised one hundred and sixty-two thousand dollars for flood relief in Eastern Kentucky. Sean, uh, how cool was that event and just being a part of that? It is super cool. I thought being in an area of the state where I've visited, I'm from the six area code. I thought that it was a really cool thing. You got to see people probably show up for an event that. Probably don't have opportunity to make it to Rupp Arena often. I thought that was the coolest thing about doing that and uh, and having it in that part of the state. And then you you had the the picture that made its rounds yesterday, the, the coal miner that brought his child there and, and everything, and John Calipari recognizing that, that. That's what that was about Saturday night, was that part of the state getting an opportunity. I mean, look, the streets of Pikeville were flooded with Kentucky fans because Kentucky men's basketball was in town. Pikeville's not the biggest area in the state like me and you were talking about where we parked i thought i was going to get towed i had no idea where i was going to park there were so many cars there were so many people and i saw i walked out when i left and there were two kids walking out with their dad and i remember their dad talking to them and saying how cool was that guys and they were like that was the coolest thing that i've ever seen and they're like we'll try to make it up to a game at rep arena this year and then i was talking to them and i said have you ever they said no i've never taken them to a game this is the first time that they've ever got to see anything and it's 15 minutes from our front door like that was what it was about yeah it, it was awesome event i love that you know the governor was down there the uh just it was filled from top to bottom with people that yeah, this backlash is really bad i'm not sure what the deal is um hopefully we get that fixed here at some point soon because i all i hear is myself talking um <laughs> Anyway, in, in terms of uh, individual standouts, Antonio Reeves leads the way with 27 points, 8 of 19 shooting, 5 of 12 from 3. Uh, an incredible event, an incredible performance on his end. He is the event MVP. Uh, what, what did you think of, of Antonio Reeves? Man, it's it's something, right? Like uh, two, It's two times that we've seen Antonio Reeves. Well, five games, two appearances. He's been an MVP both times. Uh, his, his ability to be instant offense, to hit shots, getting to the rim, all these different things that he's doing and making an impact. I mean, I, I, you remember this. Like, when he first got to Kentucky or when he first committed to Kentucky and signed, I, me and you talked on this show, and I said, I don't think he's going to average 20, 21 at Kentucky. One, because I didn't think he would get the shot attempts enough to get it. Like, mm-hmm. this is a guy that's being efficient right now, Jack. Efficient from the three-point line, efficient from two, efficient with his overall game. That really stands out to me about his efficiency and what we've seen from five games with him. And, and I don't care what the competition is. I don't care if it's in the Bahamas. I don't care if it's just going against each other in practice. Like you're seeing something special through five appearances with him that 
that is a guy that John Calipari can go to, and he's gonna he could go for eight an eight zero run, ten zero run on his own, just like that. Yeah, uh, and I realized what the the feedback was, and it was me having our live stream going on in the background, and I was hearing our echo <laughs> right behind us. I was like, dude, this is driving me absolutely crazy. Well, I heard it myself too, and I was like, I'm just gonna keep talking, but it's so hard to think. Yeah, sorry. That was uh, very, very difficult to get through. So we are, we are in the clear now. We, we, I, we figured out what the deal was. So uh, apologies for the first couple minutes of awfulness because I did not enjoy that uh, uh, whatsoever. Anyway, we are back on track, back to uh, talking about all the good stuff that we need to get through. Uh, Adu Thero, another guy. Again, we're talking about – so the, the white team wins 70-67, to 67, and all of the talk was about the losing team and just how impressive their effort was, Sean – uh, the fact that, uh, you know, they had two walk-ons on their team. It was Adu Thero, Antonio Reeves, Ugana Kingsley on Yenso, and then two walk-ons in, in Walker Horn and uh, uh, and uh, Brennan Canada were the other two. So the fact that it was as close it was, as it was from start to finish, UK, uh, the, the blue team competes basically until the very last shot. Adu Thero has a chance to tie it up and send it to overtime. Um I love the fact that it was as competitive as it was in that team, you know, trying to will itself to uh, a really competitive there, you know, finish there at the end. And Adu Thiero was a big part of that 21 points, 12 rebounds, six assists, three uh, steals and three turnovers as a lead point guard, which is something that he was that a little bit in high school. And, you know, his senior year, that's definitely, you know, who he was, um, you know, leading their team, but, He's since grown three to four inches. He's now six six and growing. Cal talked about him today at, at media day. So he just keeps growing, and we don't know uh, how tall he's going to be at the end of the day. But he took over lead point guard dues, and he was sensational, Sean. He, he you know talked to the media after the game and said, "Yeah, this is something I'm ready for. I'm prepared for this moment." And I really, really liked what I saw from Adu Thiero. It made me think that that there's clearly a role somewhere for him in this rotation. There is. And, and the way that that game started, it was his jump shot, right? Like he, he knocks down a three early, then he knocks down a long two, and then he hits another three. And you kind of saw that that was the area of his game when he first committed that was the question mark, right? We knew he had great size. We knew that he had potential as a defender. But it was what would he be as a three-point shooter, as a, as a jump shooter? And you've seen it through the Bahamas and now – the blue white game like that that's a guy that can knock down some shots but his size and ability to play through traffic and through that first and second bump that's what stands out to me about him jack and look he's doing it against the best versions of kentucky right i know no no savir wheeler but the group that he was playing against there there were some good dudes on the other side of the of the roster there on the other team so like if he can do that against his guys in practice what can he do against these opponents and stuff here in the non conference and i think that the arrow is going to get a shot uh, Ugana, the other standout for that team, 14.69 shooting, five rebounds, four blocks, Sean, that were incredible. I mean, uh, he had a couple. There was one, Chris Livingston, trying to go up strong, finish at the basket, uh, and uh, he sent it into the stands. That was something that everybody, you know, uh, talked about his his shot blocking abilities and what he uh, can be down the road, an elite shot blocker. You know, I interviewed him a couple weeks ago, and he said, uh, I, I'm, I was the best shot blocker in high school, but I plan on being the best shot blocker in college as well. He's clearly rough around the edges offensively. He's clearly got a lot to work on uh, down the road in that regard on, on, you know, the touch and the, you know, the footwork and the interior presence on that end of the floor. But defensively, Sean, he showed that he has something there right now. And, and Cal brought it up today at media day. I say, um, said, yeah, you know, he's, he's you know, a little intimidated by the spotlight right now. It's still way too early for him, you know, to ask, ask a whole, whole lot of him. But he said what he can do, nobody else can do. And, Sean, that those type of players with those individual special traits have always worked their way into the rotation for Cal. Every year there's that guy that said there's nobody else that can do what he does. And that leads me to believe that, that it may not be a lot, but we're going to see Ugan on the floor at some, at some point. Well, it's one of those things that when you're you're talking about those individual things that make these players elite or the one thing that they can kind of focus on. And when it's not shooting, I feel like that it's easier to kind of have that success and to carve out a role on, on, a, on a team for John Calipari. And his ability to affect shots at the rim with his size and with his length, that plays. Like that is – that's something that this team is going to need – as it goes throughout the season. If you can defend, you know you can play minutes for John Calipari. It's the players that can't defend that struggle to play for Cal or to kind of carve out a role, especially early on, because we know that all not all these guys are going to make shots every single night, but defense does travel. And if you can affect the game with your length and especially above the rim, 
and then he catches some lobs and creates some offense that way. I think you're. I think you might have an opportunity to see him. Yeah, I, I, he he's a guy that I think the expectation was when he signed that it was going to be a wait and see approach. We're going to see why, you know what he that is. That was the right approach, done. right? Like yeah, you, you don't absolutely. want to throw it all at him because it's a new thing for him. So you kind of want to say, here, this is what we're, well, this is what we're expecting, but let's not handcuff you to this. Mm-hmm. And it's it's something that he also appreciated and something that he embraced as well talking to him you know during, earlier in the off season when he first got to you know campus it was a you know I, i'm in no rush I, i'm somebody that understands who i am yeah i'm trying to you know his his role model in life is uh Giannis Antetokounmpo. he wants to be a Giannis type player at the end of the day where you know he's that seven foot freak of nature can shoot can you know bring the ball to the floor can block shots can rebound can do this you know, all in one basketball player that makes Giannis so special. He wants to be that at the end of the day. Obviously, there's a long, long, long way to go with that, but he understands the process that it takes uh, and he's welcoming that with open arms. And the fact that he is as far along as he is now and, you know, as is growing as fast as he is right now and, you know, talking to people on the staff and, you know, people around the program say he's. You know, high basketball IQ, very mature player, somebody that uh, they, you know, is really further along than they anticipated. That's a really good sign, Sean. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, flipping gears on the other team, CJ Frederick, he makes his return to the floor. Love, love what we saw out of CJ. He goes for 18 points, 7 11 shooting, four of five from three, uh, five rebounds, two assists. Uh, one steal, only one turnover. Again, he's a guy that has proven that he just doesn't turn the ball over often. Uh, he did a lot of, uh, you know, facilitation, you know, you know, trying to initiate and, and uh, you know, set up his teammates more so than just finding his own shot, which I thought was a new thing that we haven't seen a whole lot of, out of him. And he still didn't turn the ball over uh, often, you know, ba- barely any at all. And in 30 minutes of action, only one turnover with a lot of touches. That's uh that that is the makings of somebody that will play for John Calipari. Yeah, and that, that jumper looks good, doesn't it? Like it looks really good in, in person and he he looks healthy. Like I think that was the biggest takeaway. He looks ready, no restrictions, out there playing, defending, knocking down shots, and had me sitting there thinking about how dynamic that offense can be when he's opposite Antonio Reeves on the perimeter. And you get maybe you run Casey Wallace at the one. And we saw Casey knock down three threes, I believe, in that game, too. So Reeves hitting the three, CJ hitting the three, Casey knocking down shots. Like that's a lineup that I want to see here in the next couple of weeks. But having him healthy and seeing him up and down the floor, having a good time and playing with confidence, knowing his body is ready, I thought was the biggest takeaway for me. And, and that's Kentucky needs him. Yeah, and, you know, it's it's how he was getting shots off, Sean, that really impressed me. And, uh, you know, he was a guy that you you knew he was a coin flip three-point shooter when he came here from Iowa. You knew the stats, 46.6% career three-point shooter. You know how – you know he was going to get his shots off, but how was he going to get his shots off? And, and I thought it was really interesting that it wasn't just in catch-and-shoot looks. He was, you know, creating his own three-point looks, uh, you know, kind of with the ISO hesitation – uh, you know, didn't do any step back crazy stuff, but, you know, creating his own shot and, and you know, comfortable creating off the dribble uh, in you know, stepping into shots, not just, you know, catch and shoot looks, but his confidence to lift Sean. And he just kept going up and up and up and, and lofted it over. You know, I mean, there were defenders with, you know, bare, almost touching his hand and just lofting it right over. And I mean, the ball barely touched the net. I mean, it, it just that level of confidence in the shooter. We talked to a dude hero after the game, uh, and he said every single time C.J. Frederick takes a shot, you expect that thing to fall. Uh, and then uh, Antonio Reeves also said uh, that kid has a strap on him. So that the, those two battling back and forth, he said that's uh, you know that's why that's why I'm confident in saying that nobody's going to be able to guard us this year because you're going to have to guard one of us. You're not going to guard me, and that was something Antonio Reeves said. You, I mean, you're not going to guard me. And you're definitely not going to be able to guard him as well if you're guarding me. So he was like, "You got to pick. You got to pick your poison. Who you're going to guard? And if you have both of those two on the outside, uh, Sean, I, that makes for a well, uh, very, very scary perimeter." And you already mentioned, I think, the biggest thing that gives him an edge, especially early in the season against Kentucky's tougher opponents. When we're talking Michigan State and we're talking Gonzaga and and who they're going to play there in the non-conference, is his ability to take care of the basketball and not turn it over. Like, we're talking one season at Iowa there. I think it was the last season at Iowa, the last season he played. I think he committed 10 turnovers. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, he played pretty much perfect basketball in his appearances in the Bahamas. I know he had the the one uh, the other night there in the blue-white game. But his ability to take care of the ball 
and make shots, that will play, especially early in the year, where there's going to be some some mixing up. Well, there's going to be some mistakes, especially from some of the younger guys. They're going to try to, to overplay or they're going to maybe going to try to do too much at certain points. Having that luxury of being able to put a guy on the floor that stretches you out defensively but can also defend his position on the other end and take care of the basketball, wouldn't be shocked if, he, if he's at full strength and healthy if you see some games early where CJ maybe gets north 26, 27 minutes just because Cal probably trusts him. Yeah, and, you know, it's a difficult difficult question because Cal is somebody that likes to cut his rotation the way he does at, by the end of the year. It's almost always a seven- or eight-man rotation by year's end. And it's a great question. Uh, Bourbon Kingdom asked, realistically, what eight guys are going to play. I'm looking forward, looking and really can't figure out who is going to get shortchanged on playing time. And, it, Sean, it's a great question because you look down this roster right now, the three guys that were out in the blue-white game, Xavier Wheeler, uh, Oscar Sheba, and Lance Ware, Lance, I think, may end up being an odd man out. And, you know, not the odd man out, but he could be a guy that, that you know, he only averaged six, seven minutes a game last year. I wouldn't be shocked if he we see something similar with him this year because of the growth with Damian Collins, because of maybe the defensive potential of, of Ugo. Uh, so those type of questions, you know, they, they're valid, but, you know, do you see it being an eight man rotation? Do you see that? Do you, do you see him cutting the, the, the end of bench fat, well, you know, down from, from 10, maybe to eight. I, I do. Are, obviously. I, I just knowing Cal and who Cal's going to be when this team gets to the NCAA tournament, against gets postseason play. It's going to be eight. And it also wouldn't shock me if it becomes seven. And I, it's just, what is it going to be? Who is it going to be? Uh, and, and that eighth guy may only play four or five minutes. And if they go to nine, maybe the ninth guy only plays three or four minutes. Maybe it's not a ton of minutes. But I do think early on, when you're talking these November games through champions, you're going to see him probably extend into nine guys. But I think when you get closer to late conference play, you get in December, CBS, Michigan, Louisville, and get into league play, I do think you're going to see him condense it down to eight because that's just what Cal prefers. I mean, as a coach, I prefer the exact same thing. I love playing a lot of kids, but at the same time, it's just you get that rhythm as a coach. You get that camaraderie and stuff with within a group of guys. And I think that this is a team that when it comes down to it, you you kind of want seven or eight to kind of separate themselves and be the best of the best because then that means you're probably really, really good with those eight. We're talking when they won the title in 2012, there weren't a lot of guys that played maybe seven. I believe on that team, uh, some of the better teams that Cal's had have played seven guys. I remember the 2011 team didn't play a bunch of guys either. Uh, so I think that that's what John Calipari is going to do. But I think he's going to give them plenty of opportunities to kind of carve out roles. And if, if nine deserve to play, he will play nine. But I fully expect this thing to probably settle somewhere at eight. But uh, interesting to see how many minutes that eighth guy gets. And is it a different eighth guy every game? Is it a guard one game? Is it somebody in the post one game, depending on foul trouble situations and health? But uh I, th I think it's going to be eight. Eight's probably the, the safe pick for a number when it comes to rotation. So that would be Savir, Kaysen, um Antonio, Jacob Toppin, Oscar Sheboy, Damian Collins. That's six, right? Damian Collins, Chris Livingston, and who am I missing? DJ. Oh, and and CJ. I think that I think those are your eight if it gets cut to eight. I, I do too. And, and that's where I'm coming from, that it, it may be stretches to nine if you need it, if it's Lance, if you need some. Because we, we know that they're going to need some bodies and some minutes there inside. But if Oscar's not in foul trouble and if he's in great shape, does do they ride Oscar north of 30 minutes? Does he play 31, 32 minutes? We know he's going to be in great shape. The only thing that concerns you is we saw some wear and tear happen to that backcourt last year. And you don't want to be – you don't want your guards playing 35, 36 minutes a night in SEC play on a Tuesday night turn around and get on Saturday doing the exact same thing. And when you get into the ground of league play, you want some depth and you hope that this is a team. And I, and I think it will be, I think this is a team that's going to be able to, to put some beatings on some teams, even in league play. Some of the lower half teams of the league, you want to be able to, to beat some of these teams and rest some guys, especially when you get into that January, February schedule. But last year, this team ended up playing a lot of close games. Mm -hmm. Let's get you out of here with this. Case and Wallace played uh, a lot of minutes at the one. That was a, a topic of conversation today at Media Day. Uh, Cal saying, I have not played him 
any off the ball, which I thought was a very telling quote because he said, look, it's a one-on-one -on -one point guard battle. We don't have any other point guards on the roster. He was like, yes, yeah, sometimes Antonio Reeves, maybe, but our two point guards on the roster are Casey Wallace and Saverio Wheeler. Does that change anything for you about who this team starter could potentially be? Is it Savier's team still? But do you find it interesting that we are now going into our very first exhibition game where we're going against other teams and Jason still hasn't played a single minute of off ball uh, guard in practice? I think that this was more because Cal knows he needs him as that second point guard. So I think that he gave him probably 90% or maybe even 100 Well, If he says he not played him off the ball any, then that was intentional because he knows that he's going to need him for stretches of games to be the one because Kaysen's going to be able to slide and play the two. We know that. I think he's going to be able to play alongside Savir. I think Savir will be the starter. I mean, how could you not when you're talking a guy who's led the, the Power Five in assists the last couple of years, has a great chance to do it again this year. And I think life is going to be easier for Wheeler this year because of C.J. Frederick, because of Antonio Reeves. Kentucky's got some guys that can spread you out and, and stretch you out defensively on the floor, which is going to leave more space for Savir to kind of turn the corner, get downhill, get in the paint. you got Oscar Sheboy there at the rim. But I think Kaysen playing all of his reps and stuff in the fall at the one just tells you that John Calipari knows that he needs that other guy that can do it there. Now, we know Ty Ty Washington was that guy a year ago, but I, I think Kaysen and his ability to defend and to set the tone on that end of the floor and just be a bull with the ball in his hands, and as strong as he is, you're going to see Kentucky late in games possibly play through him with the ball in his hands and rather than Savir. Yeah, and it should be also noted that Cal went out of his way to say he is more um, further along than most freshman guards that, that he is – he is used to in the past. And Oscar said the difference between this year's team and last year's team is how advanced and, and mature the freshmen are on this team, specifically with Casey. Well, and, and I think the thing that's really stood out to me in the time that we've seen in Bahamas and Blue White game is, is his jump shot. His ability to make the three separates him too because we know what he's given you defensively on the ball and off the ball. We know that he's going to be able to be strong and get in the paint, get two feet in the paint and finish through in traffic. If he's able to knock down that shot, then what it does give you is it gives you a guy that the one with the ability to play Reeves and CJ opposite one another, you still got an elite defender on the floor in case and Wallace on the perimeter. Like Cal's got some options when it comes to his backcourt that I that I think that he's going it, to – it's going to be fun. And, and you got – I mean, you're talking a do the arrow. I mean, arguably one of the better-looking players Kentucky's had so far in the five games that we've seen. And he just keeps getting better. Like that was the the improvement in some of these guys that I saw from August until last weekend. It, it, it's really, really impressive. And I, I can't wait to see where they go between now and December, December and February, and then even into March. Like he has options in the backcourt. Sean, we got to get you out here. You have a game to go coach. You have a win to go get. Uh, tell fans where they can find your work. You can find my work at GoBigBlueCountry.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at GBBCountry. And, yeah, we beat one of the top teams in the state last night to, to open our season. So uh, trying to start 2-0 tonight. Keep that momentum moving forward, Sean. Always a blast having you on. Thank you. Yeah, talk to you all soon. See you. All right. Now it's just me, myself, and I until Steven jumps on. He's going to be asking some questions. Uh, he's going to go to the fan chat. There's already some coming in. My guy Zion, who's a, a you know, D he's a Duke media guy. He uh, uh, always enjoys talking trash. Um, I went on one of his little uh, things last year, the uh, a preseason thing leading up to the Champions Classic, and uh, we had a Ty Ty Washington debate where he said that um, who was the the guard on Duke last year, Trevor Keels. Uh, I saw Trevor Keels play in high school, and I was not a fan of his game at all. I thought that he would end up being a bust at Duke. I ran my mouth before that Champions Classic game, uh, and then go figure. Trevor Keels absolutely kills Kentucky, and Ty Ty Washington has one of his worst games of the season. So he was in the chat saying, talk about Ty Ty Washington. Yeah, 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 he's going to be a great pro, and I'm very excited about my guy Ty Ty. Uh, and also said Dariq Whitehead, greater than, greater than, greater than, greater than, which uh, – not a big fan. I think he's like Archie Goodwin 2.0, and I hope uh, the best for him, and I hope the best for the Duke basketball program because I think they're going to be pretty underwhelming this year. Steven, my guy, is on. What's going on, buddy? Hey, how you doing? 
Uh, we are hanging in there, obviously uh, adjusting on the fly here, especially with my uh, moron self dealing with the te technical difficulties. I'm hearing echo in my in my ear in the background, and I'm like, I'm losing my <laughs> mind up here thinking that uh, there's some te technical difficulties. Little do I know it's uh, operator error on my end. So uh, we are good to go and uh, very excited to have you on and, and you know ask some questions, talk a little bit about the team, your thoughts too. It's not just a, a me show. I want to figure out your thoughts on the team as well. Yeah, I mean, having uh, talked to a lot of the guys today from Media Day, uh, I, I will say this. I, this is the most excited I've been for a Kentucky basketball team in a few years. And they've, I mean, the, last year's team was good. The 2020 team that didn't get to play in the tournament due to COVID, I thought that team was really good. Uh, but th as far as excitement for me going into the season, this is the most excited I think I've been since maybe like the Monk, uh, the Bam out of bio year. Um, I think they got a really good chance to win a lot of games. And, and of course, they asked Cal – the second question today was, uh, how do you prevent St. Peter's <laughs> from happening again? I loved his response to that. The, the tournament is random, and it has, it's happened to Duke. It's happened to other teams. Um, so it's, it's hard to say, like, this is a Final Four team for, you know, because the tournament is just random. But I think, uh, I think Cal said it uh, back in, like, 2011. You keep – you get good enough teams that you can keep knocking on the door. You're going to – bust through at some point so i think this is another team that can make a a, a good run in the tournament um but it's random so yeah I, I thought the most telling quote cal had a lot of cool stuff that he said today obviously but the most telling thing that i heard today personally was oscar shiboy talking about his excitement for this team and why he's so excited for this team and he said look last year's team was really good i love that team i love the you know the the vets i love the young guys it, you know it was a good mesh of of, of talent but he said the difference between last year's group and this one is just how physically mature and mentally mature, I guess, as well with the with the freshmen. He said that there was too much up and down last year with the freshmen and some of the younger pieces that, you know, just didn't have a lot of experience on this team. And it kind of pushed the team back and, and at, at the teams, uh, you know, at their worst, I guess. Uh, it, you know, some of it was because of of the new faces and the difficulties they had. And he said, what I, what makes me really excited about this team is that, you know, it's more consistency. There's more continuity. There's, you know, the new faces are back. There's five, you know, five players that are back, six, you know, six if you're including C.J. Frederick. And a lot of returning faces that went through the St. Peter's game, went through the, you know, the, the grind of all that and, and, you know, the injuries and all that stuff. They know kind of where things fell flat last year and how to compensate for that. And then you just so happen to get Case and Wallace and Chris Livingston and I, and even a do Thero who there were no expectations for him going into the year. Uh, and the, all three of those guys, uh, you know, clearly looking the part physically, you know, three clear standouts between the three of them, 21 points for a do a do Thero and 15 apiece for uh, Case and, and Chris uh, for the other team. So I think the difference is going to be the, the freshman. And, and I think it's pretty telling that Oscar said the exact same thing to you. Yeah, one of the things I liked uh, I liked from Oscar was uh, Drew Franklin asked him, you know, uh, why do you love Kentucky so much? And I, I I highly recommend going to the YouTube our YouTube channel here and looking up that. And I think Drew already posted that answer. Uh, man, he had some so, so many good things to say. But the thing that stood out to me was that he said he when he's done he wants to have a farm in Kentucky. Uh, I don't know if you got a chance to hear that yet, but that's his yeah. that's his long term goal um, is to own a farm in Kentucky. Um, so I, th I thought that was interesting. But, yeah, I mean, I, it, and like you said, uh, this being a more experienced team, I, Oscar was talking about how he wants to improve on his passing. He said, like, they're going to double him. He wants to – that's the one thing he thinks he can impress people with this year is how much he's improved, um, I guess, his vision on the court. Because, um, yeah, I mean, people are going to – he's the reigning national player of the year. He's going to he's gonna garner a lot of attention on the offensive end. So um, his ability to – and they, and they got Damian Collins. They got, uh, you know, several guys who can, he can he can lob it to. So uh, I'm interested to see that dynamic. Um, I love the way that can that the big guys are shooting the ball, mm -hmm. and I think Oscar Oscar's becoming pretty reliable too on on the mid range and at the free throw line. So. Yeah, and Oscar even said, uh, you know, talking about the rest of the team and and just how big of a fan he is of everybody else on the team. He said. I already talked to Coach Cal, and I was like, I understand that I might be losing my minutes to some of these guys that, you know, I am who I am, and, yeah, I've developed, and, yeah, I've grown. You know, I, I grew as a passer, and I'm doing thing, better, you know, things defensively and things like that. Uh, but he said, but 
so did everybody else. So did everybody else. They all got better. You know, Damian Collins got better. Jacob Toppin got better. Lance Ware got better. You have, you know, Ugo, uh, you know, stepping in at the, as the backup center who Cal said, you know, earlier today, again, that, that he does things that nobody else can do and, in, in, you know, in terms of shot blocking. So he's like, I already understand that there's a chance that me, national player of the year, you know, breaking all these records. And he didn't say this because he's too, you know, he's too kind and, and would never want the, that spotlight put on himself. He even said, my, all my goals are team goals this year. Uh, but he said, but I totally understand if Cal said, sorry, Damien deserves more minutes or sorry, Jacob deserves more minutes because they're outperforming, you know, me or, uh, you know, they, they you know, ride the hot hand or whatever. He was like, I'm cool with that. That's t- something that I'm totally okay with. He said, nothing about this season is about me individually. Like that was last year. I got all the individual awards that I needed. Uh, everything is about team, team success this season. I think that right there, uh, is yet another reason why why everybody should be excited about this team. Is there going to be a guy that will be – I mean, there's been – obviously, there's been players people have loved. But, I mean, of the Cal era, Oscar Sheepway could easily be number one at the end of the day. Depending on what happens this season, he could leave here as, like, the most loved player of the Cal era. And it's a good question, Stephen, because I wrote on Twitter at the end of the season, even after the St. Peter's game, after how things unfolded – I think that he deserves his jersey in the rafters right now. Like, I think what he did, the individual success, the the what his status meant to this this program, returning from that nine and sixteen year, coming out of COVID, coming out of the just the awfulness of all that. You know, Terrence Clark's death. If you want to get into the really, you know, the the deep specifics, like that was a really awful year from start to finish, and the breath of fresh air that he has been coming out of that and how he just took all of that weight and just put it right on his shoulders and how he accepted all of that and just thrived in every single category, broke every single record that there was to break. That right there is just the the definition of a special player. And, and, you know, you look at guys like Anthony Davis and you look at, you know, the special talents that are deserving of being in the rafters. You can't tell me that in in terms of one single season effort that what Oscar did – wasn't you know isn't deserving of being put in the rafters and you know if he can even touch that again this season uh, I think it's very clear that that he's a guy that uh, deserves to be in the rafters before before any of them especially if Kentucky goes on a, on a title run and he's a significant part of that and you know all that good stuff uh, I absolutely think that he will be in the conversation to to have his name hanging in the rafters and it needs to be happening sooner rather than later do you, I mean uh if you win national player of the year should you should it be an automatic a name in the rafters i mean i don't know i mean you know hopefully you have so many of them that that does become an issue um yeah. but but I, I, who all is one national player of the year for us from the cal era i'm trying to remember off the top of my head it, it's, it's uh, i think that he was the first unanimous because anthony davis was a partial uh player of the year he had uh, a couple of them but he wasn't a consensus john wall had a couple but he wasn't a consensus uh yeah he uh oscar is the first unanimous consensus player of the year so uh that that you gotta put him in the rafters yeah i mean like you said um another question that i have for you and just your thoughts today was a big day talking to oscar he said that he is back uh 100 said that he feels really good said that he will probably miss the next couple of uh, exhibition games but he said he will absolutely quote absolutely be back in time for the regular season so he will be back for uh that november 7th a matchup against Howard uh, and then obviously champions classic right, or, you know, right after that. And then uh, the uh, Gonzaga game up in the Northwest, that's when you definitely need him going up against Drew Timmy and, and, and that squad. Uh, just how excited are you to, to, to know that Oscar is going to be back when, when the games actually matter. As a, as a Kentucky fan, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty cool to see him back on the, on the court again. Um, you mentioned the Gonzaga game with Drew Timmy. I mean, you know that that's just going to be, several days of of hyping that matchup up nationally uh, so that's i mean that's huge and that's it, it playing in these uh these huge games in november uh is really cool you know there, there are times people kind of hate on the the out of conference schedule a little bit and and yeah the, for the home schedule i might i might have to agree but man this is a really really good schedule kentucky has this year i mean there are marquee games i'm, I'm excited that oscar uh at least we'll get a, a game in before having to go play in some kind of in, in this in a huge game in the Champions Classic. So well, um, yeah, Trent, Trent Cooper jumped in and said the powerful Howard squad. Yeah, that, that's kind of what you want. You want Oscar to go in there. I mean, you don't want him to go in there rust on. You know, I, I don't think Oscar is a guy that would have rust because 
you know, he's a machine that doesn't rust, I don't think. But uh, all things considered, you still want him to get a game under his belt and, you know, kind of just get used to uh, the, the the game speed again. All he's been able to do, uh, I mean, he had the exhibition games earlier this, this summer, but, I mean, that's been two, three months at this point, and, uh, you know, he missed the blue-white game, missing all the practice right now, going to miss the next two two exhibition games. You want him to at least get one or two games uh, under his belt, and I think it's going to be perfect to get him back for that that Howard game. Um, and then, you know, when things really ramp up there the following week against uh, Michigan State and Indianapolis, that's going to be our first real big test of the season. I'm definitely um, looking forward to that one. Uh, I, I guess we – you know, I wasn't really super focused to start the show because all I heard was the the, the feedback <laughs> on my end. Uh, so yeah. I guess I didn't get to really share and, and talk about the, the meaning behind that trip to Pikeville and what it all meant. And, uh, I, I talked to Reed Shepard before the game started, and um, he hosted his own youth camp. Stephen, I thought that was really cool. He he uh, presented a ten thousand dollar check, and um, you know, I thought that was unbelievable for for you know fundraising efforts. And then obviously the team raises one hundred and sixty two thousand dollars. Uh, you were down there with us. Just what 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 was that event in your eyes, and then uh, uh, what, what do you think that meant to that community? So cool. Love 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 that they did it there. I, I've been. You call yourself the Commonwealth University. Cal will say that in a speech every every so often. Uh, play everywhere. Play throughout the Commonwealth. Do these things. Do these things. I, I mean, Western Kentucky could use something like like this as well. I think that was so cool. I know the people in Pikeville. I talked to uh, several people who were standing outside. Um, and by the way, standing outside with tickets in their hands, with tickets, they're, they're going to get in. They're not outside camping out for tickets. They had their tickets. They were waiting like 45 minutes to an hour, waiting for the doors to open to get to their seats that they have reserved. And the lines were backed up on both entrances to where they kind of touched, right? Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought and that's when I talked to some of these people, they were saying that, hey, we don't get a we don't get chances to go to Rupp Arena to see these guys in person. And this just means a lot that we can do this and it's in our own backyard. And, uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of people there are saying we only the only time we see Kentucky is on TV and we love the cats, but we can't get to Rupp for for the cost or that it's a two hour or so drive. Uh, really neat that they that they did that. And the, the arena was really nice. It looked and it looked good too. Like it was a full, uh, full crowd. They were into it. Um, just an all around great idea. I would love, like I said, uh, maybe I'm being greedy now, but I, I I would love to see this expand to other parts of the state also and try to hit some of these counties, especially you know uh, Western Kentucky who was hit with tornadoes, um, and and they could have something like that there. I, I know that uh, I went to school in Murray State. I know there's tons of Kentucky fans in that in that area, obviously that would love the opportunity for, uh, to, to get something like that there. So it was really cool. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, go for it. Well, I was just going to ask you uh, as far as uh, – I, I don't know that blue-white games create much excitement. You know, I don't, I don't know that – there's – especially when you have the Bahamas. So you've already seen the team. Um, and we're in past years. This may be your first chance to actually see them play in kind of a game. But the uh, – the excitement and buzz around the arena was, I mean, that I, I just felt like that was such a, I don't think you would have, do you think you would have had that in around Rupp arena if they had, they had it back in Lexington? Of course not. Yeah, I, that event, I, I think that's something that we've talked about that, you know, maybe blue white game and, and big blue madness need to start getting combined. And, you know, the, there's a lot of intrigue and excitement for big blue madness. And then by the end of the event, everybody's kind of left like, uh, that was a little underwhelming like that, you know, all that hype for this like that's that's what we all got excited and camped out for and that's what we got all excited about uh, and especially the scrimmage at the end of big blue madness where you know it's basically a full court layup line i've said that on the show several times there's, there's really no redeeming quality of that scrimmage uh, at the end of the blue, at the end of the big blue madness and then the competitive side of things on the blue white game is almost always better and and you know you get real basketball being played but you know, usually half the arena is empty because it's just a blue white game. It's just a scrimmage. It's not the you know lead up to the season. It's not you know. It's just a, another intra squad scrimmage. So if you could combine the the excitement of Big Blue Madness and the quality of play in in you know blue white, you could pretty you can get a pretty cool uh, event. That's kind of what we got. Uh, down in Pikeville. And I think that's why there was so much excitement because it was fresh. It was new. It was something different uh, that nobody got. And it was for an area in need. It was for a good cause. Um, 
uh, Stephen, I, I love the fact that even with seven scholarship players, they had to have, or I, I guess it was eight with with Ugo, but he's not even you know considered one of the, the top end guys. Um, you know, you're down Lance Ware, you're da- down a Duke Thero, you're down, uh, or you're not uh, uh, Savir Wheeler and, and Oscar Sheboy, and still it was a competitive game. Uh, they only played 30 minutes at the beginning of it. Cal had to kind of push back because there were people still outside, like you said, line wrapped around the building, waiting to get in. Uh, and then because of they were sh- so shorthanded with, with you know injuries, they didn't want to play a full 40 minute scrimmage, so they did some you know practicing and things like that. So the product itself, as amazing as that ended up being, was you know even it, considering being you know short short shorthanded with you know injury, and they had to adjust on the fly with that. So it could have been even better. And they still made do with what they had, and I thought that part was the most most impressive. That uh, even though they were shorthanded, they still put forth an amazing event, uh, and it was a competitive game right, right there to the end. I, you know, uh, this isn't probably the biggest deal from the blue white game, but I did like how the uh, the players stayed on blue and players stayed on white, so it kind of mm-hmm. had the feel of an actual game. And they didn't. I know in past years it kind of just they were on the blue team in the first half, now they're on the white team in the second half, and it kind of loses the the competitiveness of of the event. Uh, you know, if you're you know, looking to, you know, for a close game. And this one came down to a team needing a three at the buzzer and didn't get a shot off. So if this was a real game, everyone would have been frustrated and upset. But, or, you know, unless they were, they were, uh, was it the white team that won? It was the white team, 70 okay, to 60. Unless you're fans of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but on that note, uh, on not getting a shot off, that was a, a solid defensive effort. Or I guess if you want to just yeah. kind of criticize Adu for overdoing things at the end of the game and losing the ball out of bounds, but. Either way, however you want to call it, uh, John Calipari said they are very, very far along offensively, and he loves how uh, you know advanced they are on that end of the floor, but said they are a little bit behind defensively, and practice is dedicated almost entirely to defense right now. What do you make of those comments and uh, the fact that, you know, despite how many defensive standouts they have, you know, Savir Wheeler and, you know, uh, a couple other pieces that, that can clearly defend their butts off, uh, still being a little bit behind, all things considered. Well, you know, and that's the thing that uh, I was I was talking to somebody about yesterday. I think it was Adam Luckett uh, on our way back covering covering football. Was uh, I, I think that Kentucky has some some guys who can really shoot the lights out, but can they play on the defensive end? That's always been an issue with some shooters on Cal teams that they uh, they they can't play man to man defense, or they or, the, or they you know their defensive breakdowns when they're in the game. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, you have – I love the way Severe Wheeler is as an on-ball defender. I mean, I think that you have guys who can um, who can make plays. But, yeah, I mean, I, I'm more, I'm way more excited about the offense. I, I, I'll, I'll ask you this, Jack. I mean, I, this is something Adam and I were talking about uh, that we were kind of discussing. That is, is this one of the – does this have the potential of being one of the better uh, shooting teams that Cal has had? And you've got two shooters who uh, – shot really well on Saturday, but I think there's there's some of the big guys who can step out and hit from deep also. I mean, that I feel like there's just weapons all over the court. Yeah, uh, Damian Collins is a guy that I think is going to be a surprise in terms of his shooting ability. He's doing some cool stuff, you know, with his face-up game. I don't know if it's going to extend to the to the perimeter, but definitely in the mid-range, he has that. Uh, even Ugo in practice, he's showing off a jump shot. Oscar Shibway showed that off last year. Uh, there are a lot of different positions that you can look at and, and uh, you know, different lineups that you can utilize that really kind of maximize that and, and kind of give you five different shooting off uh, shooting options on the floor at once. You know, uh, Cal was talking about using Casey Wallace as a point guard and said, you know, if Savir is not making shots, then you have other guys that will replace him uh, in the lineup. Casey being that guy said he's being used exclusively as a one right now. Casey can shoot. He went three for six from the three point line. Uh, in the scrimmage and, and you know, his growth as a, as a shooter the last year has just been just unprecedented. He's been really, really good in that regard. So if you start him, you have Antonio Reeves at the two, clear knockdown shooter. CJ Frederick, clear knockdown shooter. At the four, if you want, you know, Jacob Toppin, who, you know, was lights out in the Bahamas, and he has proven that he can uh, definitely make shots. And then Damian Collins, if you put him at the five, he's a, a three-point shooter as well if you want him to be. And, you know, at least somebody that you have to, con- you know, content- contest. Like, he's not somebody you can just leave open. And I think that kind of makes you uh, really, really tough to beat. And I think that's something that Cal will probably keep in mind and go, you know, you like what Oscar brings to the table and, and, and you know, how special he is. Savir, you're going to need to put him on the floor. But if you need a, a shot, you have a lineup that, that's going to go get you a shot. Yeah, uh, you know, if you were scouting Kentucky, Jack, what, 
what what weaknesses are you looking at on the offensive end? You've seen, I know you've seen, uh, like kind a kind of game, um, but just from what I guess from what you've seen is where is it that Kentucky is? Uh, there are times when it feels like getting a basket is really hard. Like there are times when the Kentucky teams will go on droughts, and it's just how are they going to get the ball into the basket? Is do you do you see that being a problem? And if you do, where does where like where are those weaknesses at? You know, I, part of my concern is I love the upside of Jacob Toppin. I love that Jacob is a guy that has taken a clear clear jump this offseason. Cal continues to say that, yeah, he might be still be a little mature, immature, said uh, he was 13 years old last year. Now he's grown up to 16 years old mentally. And, you know, I drew a big laugh from the crowd. Um He's a guy that Cal said lives in the in the lock in the weight or in the, the gym right now. He is constantly uh, knocking down shots, leads the team in shot attempts. Uh, with the, they have this new electronic system that kind of does facial recognition, uh, where the you know the staff can kind of track who is shooting well. Uh, it's like a you know the, it measures the arc, it measures the left the to right. Craziest thing, it, like yeah, very very high tech advance. Jacob was leading the team well. in, in that regard. However. He is a very confident guy, and those type of guys can sometimes shoot you out of games and, you know, kind of build up a bigger role than maybe that they need to have. And that might be my concern is, you know, are there guys that will shoot you out of games? Antonio Reeves when mm -hmm. you know, hey, he had a great game, but he was also eight for 19. And, you know, there are times that, you know, does he kind of have that chucking mindset is, is Sabir Wheeler, does he have, you know, he gets erratic at times and gets a little – uh, you know, he made some mistakes that kind of cost Kentucky that St. Peter's game last year. So mm -hmm. those are some of my bigger questions. Do Are you going to be able to reel in those guys? Are you going to be able to kind of hit pause on things and go, you need to slow your roll. You need to, you know, feed the hot hand. Go to who is, you know, carrying this team right now. Just quit trying to make it about yourself and make sure it's, it's, it's a team first mindset. That is probably the biggest concern, but it's a, a very minor one because, we did just see Kentucky win four games by an average of 50 points a game. And, you know, we've seen just how advanced this team is offensively and what they can do. I, I think it might just be, you know, being nitpicky for the sake of being nitpicky. I really don't know if there are that many major flaws on this team. But if you were to get nitpicky, I think that's kind of uh, a direction I would go with. Yeah, I mean, there's just, like you said, just – so many weapons if this if this you know this could be a team where you don't really have like somebody averaging uh, uh, you know a, a ton of points because you can kind of spread the offense around uh you might have a different leading score every game um there's um i'm seeing some people in the comments talking about playing zone and that's just that is going to be something we we will talk about until cal leaves kentucky because uh as you know is is there going back to talking about the defense is this a team? Is this a team that could play a zone? Or is that just something that we got to just stop talking about because that's just never going to happen? Well, or if it, if it does, well, it will until they hit one three, and then they'll go back to man. Cal literally brought it up today in terms of going against a zone. So you know, I, I guess uh, you know, implementing one for you to figure out how to go against one. I guess is kind of what Cal was saying, but it's at least the zone conversation brought up and he, he to this point literally said, we haven't even sniffed it yet. Haven't even looked at the zone yet. So he was like, that's, that's clearly something we got to address. That's something we got to touch on here soon. And as soon as he said that, uh, I, I reading these comments, Bubba Watson brought up no zone playing teams have, have only won at once. And he said several times about, um, you know, playing zone, how his ego costs us plenty of times. You got to switch it up. Why wouldn't you? Didn't sound like we were in any rush to change that up anytime soon, Stephen. And uh, it's just not yeah. something Cal Cal has ever been a fan of. And I don't think uh, when you, once you're stuck in your ways, it's not something that you're just randomly happy to change uh, here. This what, what is it? it? Is it that he likes to have guys accountable? Because a man to man, you can kind of be accountable for for your own guy. Um, is is that what it is? Or I mean, there you know you look at like. I'm not. I'm not at all suggesting that Kentucky goes into a, a, a two-three zone like Jim Beheim does at Syracuse. But you yeah. look at what what Syracuse has done. Some they get in the tournament and they they make a run. It feels like if they just make it to the tournament, they because teams don't shoot well against that that two-three zone, especially when you got guys who are long and and uh, you when you catch a pass inside out like you do against man to man, I feel like you can get your feet set. You're stepping into your shot, but when you're catching it from the side and having to turn your body, I, I do feel like. 
you know, unless you work that ball middle than out, out to the wing, yeah. you are, I mean, you're, it's a tougher shot catching it from the side and, and, and getting shot off. So I've, I've, I've noticed that Kentucky struggles against the zone. Um, it's, and it, it felt like, you know, um, but again, yeah, we're not, that's, I don't even know why I even bother talking about it because <laughs> I don't think it's always, worth, it's always worth, yeah. worth at least addressing and bringing it up because, you know, what if, what if this is the year? Because, you know, we're getting some changes, you know, he's getting more open talking about injuries, you know, you know, connecting well, better with the fan base, all those things. What if this was the year, Steven, that, that we just, uh, day one, we see a two, two, three, just from, from the, the start of the, the, the Howard game. Could you imagine just the, uh, like, what, what oh, would wow. the betting odds be for, uh, to start the season with a two, with, two, with a two, three zone against, uh, is it Howard? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, the, uh, I, what I was going to say was that I, I don't know if, if Cal, I, I don't know if it's stubbornness. I think what would have to happen though, for him to switch up to a two, three zone, I think it would have to like, he'd have to like market it as like his a new idea. You know, it would have to be the, this is like the defensive tweak or something, you know, cause he can't, he can't go into zone and then it work out really well. Because the fans will just roast him for it. Well, if you'd have gone zone back in 2015, maybe we win the national. We go 40 0, you know? So, you, you, yeah, I think he'd have to like almost make it a zone, but like his own little spin on it. He's a really good at marketing. So, if he can figure out a way to do that, so he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to like surrender his pride, you know? True. And, and he can maybe, maybe, but you know what? I'm not a basketball coach. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would like to think that. Although. I do have something that I want to, you, you know, you are now on this platform. You have all of our listeners. You brought up something today at Media Day that I'm going to put you on the spot. I loved your uh, theory on the Wilson Next Gen basketballs that uh, Kentucky has not been practicing with, that they will be playing with in the NCAA tournament. Tell our listeners what your theory is and what okay. needs to be going into the year. Jack, you have no idea. I've been waiting to get this out there. Uh, for a year now <laughs> that I went out and I bought that basketball. It's a, if you notice, it's that bright orange ball. Um, yep. I believe Auburn used it as well. And uh, you'll, you'll see it when you watch the games this year, you'll see the bright orange ball. That's that. Uh, it's like next NX gen uh, Wilson basketball, but, and you can look this on, look this up on YouTube or go buy it, but it's like on a, it's like a $150 basketball, but it's lighter than the, the Nike elite ball that, uh, that Kentucky normally plays with. And I, I wondered, I, I talked to some people last year before the game. I was like, and I, as a Murray state alum too, I talked to some of the people on the staff at Murray state. I was like, have y'all been practicing with that, that Wilson next gen ball, because it does feel lighter people on, on YouTube and Reddit have been saying how it's spin, it's it, the spin on it is a little bit different because of the different, it, it, it's not the same weight. It does, doesn't, it feels different. The grip on it is different. Like it feels kind of like a street ball almost. And that's the ball they're using in the in the tournament. And I I and Kentucky had struggled in the tournament last year. I don't know if we all paid attention, but they they didn't do so well. Um, it, it was in the SEC, used it. It was SEC, in the SEC time, tournament, right? and that's yes. it, they shot poorly to close out that tournament. They used well. it in Knoxville as well, and you saw Kentucky score 107. And then the two times they used that ball against Tennessee, I don't know if they cracked 70. So I'm just saying. I mean, maybe buy a bunch of those. I know you're sponsored by Nike, but just in practice, just buy a bunch of those and get used to it. Get used to shooting because well, it's different. It's the same argument that fans have about not practicing at rough. You are literally a, a quarter of a mile down the road from where you are going to be playing your actual games, but you practice. You know, not even the walkthrough, not even the pregame walkthrough is done at Rupp Arena, your home gym, where you have that opportunity to get used to the baskets and all that. And then you have to completely change your, you know, your approach and, you know, how you're shooting, you know, getting to your spots, the different spots that you're kind of comfortable with on the floor. Got to completely hit reset once you walk in there for the actual pregame, you know, warm ups and things like that. That's that's been an argument for Kentucky fans for a while. Why are we not warming, you know, going through pregame walkthrough at Rupp Arena? Kind of a similar argument, I think, Steve. Yeah, I, I think I mean, I would want to use the ball that they're that they will be using in the game, in the uh, games, uh, in the tournament games. I think there was an issue. You'll have to go back to like the 2006, I think world cup, they use a different ball that they normally use. And then that, I mean, players talked about how much of a difference that made. And I don't think it's going to, it doesn't, 
I don't think that the basketball is making as big of a uh, difference as the the the, the 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 World Cup soccer tournament ball did. But uh, same thing. I would I mean, why not? I don't know. Maybe they did practice with that. I know maybe they, they did shoot around with it and everything. But uh, I just noticed if you go and look at those numbers, games where Kentucky used the Nike Elite and the games where they used the, the next gen, it's, there's differences. I mean, it, it could just be a coincidence, but. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think there is something to be said because obviously they'd be able to, those balls would be accessible to them for the pregame, you know, shoot arounds and warm ups at the, you know, Indianapolis gym for the NCAA tournament and at the SEC tournament. But when you haven't used that specific ball all season long and then switch to it, and yeah, you get one day worth of practice with it, one day worth of walkthrough with it, like that's not enough time to get used to the touch and feel of something when, when, you know, shooters are just so muscle memory, you know, oriented and, and everything is, is about touch with them. And if, if one thing is just a hair off, it throws off their entire game. Uh, I I'm never even thought, to, I never even thought about that. I never thought about the ball making a difference until literally I bought that basketball. I was shooting around with it. And then when I, whenever I alternated out the, the, the old Wilson evolution uh, mm-hmm. uh, ball, when I, I was like, man, this ball is heavy compared to this new one. And so I wonder if the Nike Elite is. So I went out, and got a Nike Elite, and was like, "Yeah, it's it's different." And I, when I'm shooting a lot of shots with the uh, the next gen ball, and then go to the the other one, or you know, the Nike Elite, my shot is off a little bit, which is it is rare, Jack. I just to be honest, it's it's usually it's usually right on. So <laughs> uh, I was about to say, I was about to say, yeah. all right. So Stephen, you have now admitted Listen, that I'm missing more that. shots when I have to switch out the basketballs. That's what I you, should have said. You've now admitted yeah. that you spent $150 on a Wilson basketball just for the hell of it. That you went out and you got the the Wilson. You already had the the Evolution ball. You already had, and then you got the Nike Elite ball just just to test it out. Something tells me you got some hooping in your, in your, uh, I got your four years of eligibility too. So, um, but it's no, I, 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 we do a men's league thing. So I was, I, I make sure we use my basketball, the one that I'm warming up with and shooting around on my free time. So I'm like, Hey guys, like, I brought the game ball. Here you go. Here it is. Cause it's, and I'm telling you that like, I wouldn't do that if, if I wasn't uh, getting an advantage from it. So I'm thinking, yeah, practice with that ball. Um, and I don't, I mean, maybe I'm making a mountain out of a molehill here, but I don't know. We should do it. We know what, Jack. We should do a video where we. I'll bring. I'll bring both the basketballs and let you. Let maybe let some of the players just. I don't know. Try it out. Maybe let you just go up there and, and hit a few jumpers and see. I'm for uh, it. If you feel the difference, so. I, I am all the way for it. We have a couple more comments that just rolled in. Uh, Muhammad has a season record, and I'm gonna put you on the spot. Yeah, what, what's your season record? Uh, regular season, and, and I guess how you know how far you think Kentucky's going. Okay, well, first of all, I, I was kind of looking at the schedule. I saw that comment, and I was trying to add them all up in my head. Um, I, but I, I would say this uh, instead of instead of doing that, I don't. The SEC is is a lot tougher uh, than it has been. So, like when I tell people I'm I'm really excited about this team, um, I I'm not like thinking forty and oh, you know, or anything like that. Obviously, um, but man, it, it would be it, I, it's it's tough looking at that schedule. I I would say that they have the they could lose five or six games but i would be i, I would be surprised if they lost any more than that i mean I, I think that a few losses in in the sec i mean maybe four four losses um and I, and again I, you know i don't want to like overhype this team and i haven't obviously have not been able to see what the other sec teams are going to look like um and with you know new players and everything but just from looking at kentucky and looking at what kind of the weaknesses had been in the last few years, they 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 are going to have a, a really good season. I mean, I would be shocked uh, if they if they lost more than five games, five or six games. Uh, it's, I I've been thinking in terms of a comparison that 2018-19 team with Tyler Hero and PJ Washington, Reed Travis, uh, that group I, I've kind of used as my. You know, I think that could be a pretty solid comparison as to what this team's going to be just in terms of guard play and, uh, you know, having stars down low and things like that. That team lost six games in the regular season or – okay, so they lost five in the regular season and then they lost one in the uh, semifinals of the SEC tournament and then they lost in the Elite Eight uh, to Auburn. So seven total losses but five in the regular season – I think that's a pretty 
interesting comparison, although I do think this team does have very clear title, you know, uh, very strong title chances as well. Yeah, and, you know, when you get to the tournament, it's – it can be random. You can get, you know, I don't think they're going to draw a 15 seed this year. I, I would, I would say, uh, and I don't know if we have like the military coming in right now or what, but I love it. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> um, I'm right outside KS bar right now. It's been a, it's been a day, man. Uh, but, but I think that, uh, this team getting a one seed, I mean, anything less than that would, wouldn't mean they lost some games that they shouldn't have obviously. Um, but and, 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 you know, people have said in the last few years, oh, the regular season doesn't matter. You just got to get to the tournament. And that might – it might seem that way, but ones and two seeds are the only ones that win. If you if Kentucky and Connecticut are not involved, it's then if you look back to the Cal area, it's only those two seasons. It's a one seed or a two seed that's that's winning it all. So it's very important that you get you get one of those seeds. Um, I, I think that uh, – and I think Kentucky's going to get one of those two. I mean, they're going to be one of the top eight teams. I would, again, be surprised – if they weren't yeah i completely agree let's uh run through some of these recruiting things real quick before we get out of here we typically keep it right at an hour and i know you got to get home anyway i know you don't want to be living there at, at ks bar so we'll get you out of here as well michael tb has a uh, question for you when you guys touch on recruiting do you think uk will get involved with nazi muhammad's son uh seer muhammad thanks um i know you, i'm not sure if you know anything about his son uh, what would, yeah, but I know you're a diehard UK fan, you know, historically, Nas. Yeah. what would it mean for you to uh, have uh Nazi's son on the roster? Well, I think it's great. We are, we got, we got Jeff Shepard's, uh, Jeff Shepard's son, which was really cool talking to him on, on, uh, speaking of like me playing basketball. And I was talking to him on Saturday. I was like, man, I used to watch your tape. You coming off curl screens. Like that's what I wanted to do. Um, but I just, I couldn't elevate, uh, like Jeff could. So, uh, but having, yeah. So then having, uh nazi's son i mean it's it's really cool it's like the guys that were like my heroes as i was growing up now their kids are playing it's like how old am i now like <laughs> this is crazy um but but yeah i mean that yeah just have keeping those guys uh, around that would be that would be cool yeah i don't envision it unfolding unfortunately i i that would be one of those deals that you know kind of like a do theoro where you know, he probably could have gone to a, a pit or something and and played immediately and you know gotten thirty minutes a game if he had wanted if, if he would want to go that route. Uh, but Adu decided to come here because of the family ties and the relationship that his dad Almami had with Cal uh, in understanding that he might be one you know the lower end of the rotation. That could be a situation, but it's not going to be because he's a top five you know recruit and you know this highly sought after guy. He's a good recruit, solid recruit, but not a must get type guy. So if Cal wants him, I definitely think that he he is somebody that he could get. Um, but I just don't think that that's something that is is going to come to fruition at least anytime soon, unless he sees this massive jump. He did have a strong uh, summer, and, and you know there has been some buzz that you know several high majors are going pretty hard at him. But I just don't know if he's Kentucky quality uh, quite yet. Uh, a couple others. There is a question about. Um, uh, Empty money. Any update on Ian Jackson? Yeah, I heard that things went exceptionally well with Ian Jackson. That he, you know, all the boxes were checked. That, that he was looking for with Kentucky. Um, still, some talk that you know, that, is he going to want to go reclass? Is he going to want to go twenty three? If he goes twenty three, it would be a huge, huge shock for him to end up at Kentucky, which would suck because he's one of my favorite uh, recruits out there. But some recent buzz uh, about potentially staying in twenty four, which I, I think would be. A uh, huge, huge for Kentucky's chances. And if he does stay in 24, I do expect Kentucky to land him. So uh, I think everything went as well as they possibly could. And you, and Kentucky fans should be rooting for him to stay in 24. Uh, and the recent buzz is that he will be doing that. So uh, fingers crossed that uh, unfolds uh, the, the way it needs to. Jake Abner, what's the timeline expected for DJ? Look, signing day starts November 9th, Stephen, and it lasts through November 16th. So we are at most two weeks away from – from a, a decision from uh, DJ DJ Wagner, he is 100% an early signing period guy. Everything I've heard, is, uh, Kentucky is going all in for uh, the kill on that one. That was pretty clear with Big Blue Madness and all that. I talked to Reed Shepard at uh, his camp before the Blue White game, and he was very, uh, yeah, I've done a really good job recruiting him. Cal kind of put me on him a little bit, and, and you know wants me to go all in because I can connect better with you know recruits you know, my age than a 60 year old coach can. And he was like, it's nothing against coach Cal. It's just, you know, I know how to talk music with them and Fortnite and, you know, all the little game, you know, games and things like that. Um, 
you know, that he said, that's just something that Cal kind of put me on and things are going very well. And, you know, I hope, I, I hope that, you know, things work out the way they need to and that we get them. So on camera, he was very like, I have no idea, but let's go see what we can do. And then like talking to him over to the side, he was like, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about that one. So there's a lot, a lot of internal buzz right now about DJ Wagner, Kentucky, you know, zeroing in on his commitment and it coming any point at any point, it, you know, he's, I don't think he's going to be a guy that sets up this big ceremony uh, or anything. I think he's definitely more of a, unless it's, unless ESPN gets involved because of, you know, you know, the attention that he would drink, bring and the Nike connection and things like that, that could come to fruition, but I don't think it's something that he is desperately wanting. Yeah. He's a shy kind of quiet kid that would definitely just put out a commitment video and say, go cats, I'm coming. Um, but I definitely think that uh, that is something that Kentucky is, is anticipating and working on closing uh, as we speak. So uh, hopefully is there anything that's holding that. What, what do you think is holding it up? Do you think it is some type of announcement planning or um, I mean, you know, once you had the Aaron Bradshaw commitment, I, I kind of thought you might get a DJ Wagner commitment also. And uh, you know, it's now that it's been over a week now since then. Uh, well, I do know that that the Aaron Bradshaw commitment was orchestrated the way it was for a reason because they wanted it to, you know, kind of be a, a perfect preview of Big Blue Madness, kind of get the excitement high going into it, and obviously for recruiting reasons, have Aaron committed on top of Justin Edwards and Reed Shepard and Rob Dillingham, you know, all in on on DJ during their visit to Kentucky, and, and you know that that went extremely well. I know, you know, Ryan went on radio and said that you're about, you know, there's talk about, you know, he's already silently committing, they're committed. They just want to, you know, separate that a little bit. I haven't heard that. There was some talk that he was already silently committed back in the summer, you know, July, early August timeframe. But um, I don't think that was ever the case. I think Kentucky is, you know, I, without putting, you know, too much out there, you know, but, you know, putting words in his mouth or Kentucky's mouth or anything, uh, I think, that he's always made it very clear that he has wanted to be here and that Kentucky has always been that confident for that reason, that they just thought that that relationship and how far along things were, it just wasn't something that could be broken with, uh, you know, a coach going somewhere else or, you know, grandfather getting hired somewhere else or whatever. And I think that's kind of, you know, what's gotten us to this point. And I don't know if there's an, any specific holdup outside of just the fact that signing day is in two weeks. And I think that if, if you're going to have a signing day, you might as well make it a signing ceremony or, a, you know, m make it a reason to where once you commit, you can just sign uh, on that de day and then you're officially a cat. So I, I don't know if there's anything specific into that, um, but it's it, it's interesting. I, I definitely think that's, that's something that it's winding down quickly and um, – very excited to get that one over with. A um, couple others before we wrap up. Any update on Flory's recruitment? More talk uh, uh, that it's not just Cincinnati, that other schools have a chance, not necessarily Kentucky. I, like I said on the last show, uh, I talked to his guardian who said that they're working on getting a visit scheduled to Kentucky, and uh, they really like the staff, and the staff thinks that they have a chance with, with that one. So, uh, it's again, it's a complicated recruitment. I don't think it's a you know done deal in any direction. Um, obviously, his you know very close friend slash you know uh, you know the connection with Indiana Elite and his son going to Cincinnati, Drew Adams. I definitely think that's going to to make an impact. It's not a done deal that he's going to go to Cincinnati, but definitely um, you know I think it's going to impact that recruitment in some form or fashion. Just the connection that they have and. Um, but there is some talk that that other schools are getting more involved, and Kentucky is one of those schools. And um, I, I wouldn't predict that Kentucky to land him right now, but I felt feel better about it right now than I did shoot three weeks ago. So uh, I think that definitely stands for something. Adam Hicks, any more info on Eric Daly? I would still be pretty surprised if that unfolded. I was told back when that first contact happened that it was a backup plan, that it was definitely not something. Um, Definitely not something that, you know, they were prioritizing, you know, they were going after other guys and he was kind of a backup option. I still would not anticipate him ending up at Kentucky. I just think that he's a, an overseas type guy or, you know, commit somewhere and then go overseas. Just don't, don't see that one unfolding. I, and personally, I like his game. I, I think he'd be a nice backup role option for this team. If you're looking for bodies, I think he's a, you know, a, a great kind of just scholarship body scholarship piece that I, I hope that his expectations wouldn't be too, too high because I don't think that's the type of player that he is. 
Um, you know, I don't think he's an immediate impact star, but I do like his ability, and I think he he has shown some some interesting stuff here the last several months. But he's also old for his age, so um, that it could be just a product of dominating kids that are younger than him. Uh, let's get out of here, David Wood. Any news on Ron Holland? I do not think that uh, Kentucky will land Ron Holland. I I just think that that's going to be that's something that they wanted to get him on campus. He's not going to end up back on campus, and I think he's going to be committing here shortly. Um, they wanted to wait until the spring. It's not going to wait until the spring. He's going to be committing uh, in this early signing period, and if that's the case, then it's just not going to uh, work out in Kentucky's favor. Uh, Texas, Arkansas, UCLA are kind of the main schools talked about with him. Uh, I had heard that Texas was picking up steam with him, but Arkansas might be making a second push for him because – they are a little desperate to land him as well. So uh, it's other schools fighting for him right now with Kentucky kind of sliding back in the third, maybe even fourth place behind UCLA as well. So I would not anticipate uh, Ron Holland joining the fun. And I don't necessarily mind it. I think Kentucky's going to be just fine where things are uh, if and when they inevitably land DJ Wagner. I like their five man class. Um, you know, maybe a top end reclass option solidifies itself and you you know you got to go after that guy but I, I like where things stand I think that there's some other guys that return uh, from this roster to next and uh, I think it's a pretty solid core group uh, Stephen for uh, Kentucky to have going into 2023-2024 yeah uh, uh, the Cal's recruiting classes I mean in the last last couple of years have uh, really ramped up I think fans are happy to see that maybe we'll see uh Cal have some of that swagger back a little bit, uh, but I think it starts with this season. I mean, last year last year was a great regular season, and it sucks that the you know a one tournament game kind of takes all that you know fun away uh, for a lot of fans. But it was a great season this year. I think you match that with a decent tournament run, and uh, you know uh, I think fans are right back on the Cal bandwagon. I, I noticed too that that all the people who are really harsh on Cal, uh, not all the people, but a lot of people are really harsh on Cal. Of course, after the St. Peter's loss, feels like they know this team's going to be good too, because I did I, the violence. It's, it's definitely. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Well, Steven, this was a blast. I appreciate you hopping on, on, on such short notice. I, I'm sure the, the listeners appreciate it. You pr- provided some awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. Definitely appreciate it. you. haven't gotten to do this with you. Where can fans find your work? Uh, you can go to Twitter at Steven Pete KSR, uh, but also more importantly, KSR's YouTube page. If you're watching it on the YouTube page, if you're on Facebook right now, go to the YouTube page, hit subscribe. Uh, we're putting we're putting tons of content out, Jack. It's it's, it's crazy. We had I'd, we had basketball, all the stuff in basketball today. Then we had football media availability. So there's tons of Kentucky content on there right now. It is a never ending grind here uh, with the at the KSR offices. You're literally still in the KSR offices. Go home. It is time for you yeah. to get home, have some dinner, enjoy your your night, Stephen. Appreciate you. You can find my work as well at uh, KentuckySportsRadio.com, at Jack Pilgrim KSR on Twitter, and then email me, jpilgrim at KentuckySportsRadio.com. With that, we'll be back next Tuesday right here on the YouTube page, Source to Safe Feed. We will see you then.